Christ. 184. 184. Good evening, everybody. 184. We're going to start off with this one. 184, all right? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's stand to our feet, all right? We got to stand to our feet with this song. You ready? Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Think about what you're singing. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring. Then anew this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. All right, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Um, that's the one I want to sing next. It's, let me see where it's at. Heaven came down, what, what is, there you go, 796. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Did you find that one? You didn't find it? You guys are just going to have to do it old school. 796, all right, here goes. You know this song? All right. I like this one. You like this? Do you like this? How many like this song? That's a great song, isn't it? You ready to sing it? All right. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus the Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Sing that last verse. Now of a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because <coughs> when at the cross I believed, eternal and blessing supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins there washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. All right, we're going to go to that chorus, 733, I just keep trusting my Lord. I think we've got that one, don't we? Good. 
I just keep trusting my Lord. You know what? I think, let's take a church vote real quick. I think Olivia should sing that song again tonight. Is that okay? Take a church vote. Does that sound good? All right, Olivia, grab your microphone and Katie, help her get, get prepared. We're going to have to hear that song again. All right, that was a good song this morning. I'm looking forward to hearing it again. Let's 733. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and he gives a song. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. He's a faithful friend, such a faithful friend. I can count on him to the very end. Though the storm clouds darken the sky on the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. Doesn't singing make you happy? It just does, doesn't it? All right, you may be seated. Come on up here, Olivia and Katie. Let's hear that song one more time. Is the face that I see in the mirror one I want others to see? Do I show in the way that I walk in my life the love that you've given to me? My heart desires to be like you in all that I do, all I am. Do they see Jesus in me? your face do i communicate your love and your grace do i reflect who you are in the way i choose to be do they see jesus jesus in me It's amazing that you'd ever use me, use me the way you will. Help me to hold out a heart of compassion and grace, a heart that your spirit fills. May I show forgiveness and mercy the same way you've shown it to me. Do they see Jesus in me? Do they recognize your face? Do I communicate your love and your grace? Do I reflect who you are in the way I choose to be? Do they see Jesus, Jesus in me? Well, I want to show all the world that you are the reason I live and breathe. 
choose to be? Do they see Jesus, Jesus in me? Do they see Jesus, Jesus in me? That's nice when you memorize the song. It's nice for the preacher. When you memorize a song, I can ask you to sing any time. So the next several Sundays, being prepared. Now, you practice and practice and practice those songs, and you only get to do it once. I mean, it's like, I ought to, I ought to do it more than once, I would think, right? Am I on here, or did I? Good. I'm, I am? Good. All right. Good enough. Yes. No, I'm not. No. All right. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go to the book of Mark tonight. Back to, to Mark, our study of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 9. And uh, wow, this is a great story. I love this, this story. Um, the, the lessons we're doing in Mark um, on Sunday nights um, are on the subject of Jesus, what Jesus taught, the lessons he taught in the book of Mark. And if you go through the whole book and you look at all these different lessons, all the things that he said and tried to teach, um, boy, you get a, a real crash course in what it's like to be a Christian and how you're supposed to behave. And um, tonight, there's several things. I've got four, four lessons that I found in, in chapter 9 all around the same topic, and that topic is basically missed opportunities. I want to talk to you tonight about these missed opportunities and how you miss them, how you miss them. So, um, you see, we go through life, and sometimes in life, things happen one time. You got one shot. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, one chance. I've, I've, we talk about music. I've, I enjoy watching uh, some of those music shows where they have a judges up here, and then you know they'll America's Got Talent or something like that, where they're singing, and and you know a, a lot of times the, the the guy on the bench will say things like, um, "Okay, this is your one chance. You better bring your A game. Bring your top. The top. This is it." Prepared for a long time for this, this moment. And um, I think that, uh, I think the Lord works that way sometimes. He expects you to prepare, to prepare. And then there will be a moment when that preparation, it'll be time. And he'll call you. And if you're not ready, you're not ready. You know? I've... As a preacher, I've had nightmares of going to a preacher's conference and being called to preach and not having a sermon in my Bible, getting up, not knowing what to say. And that that maybe, doesn't, maybe doesn't happen to you. Jim's ever happened to you. I've had nightmares about that. Like, boy, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And now this is my one shot. And so every time I go to a preacher's conference, I got about four sermons in the back of my Bible just to make sure that if they call me, I'm going to have something to say. There are many missed opportunities that we have when it comes to serving God. And I don't want you to miss those opportunities and I don't want to miss them myself. So when we, we're going to look at these four different things. I think, I think you'll understand what I'm driving at here. Um, when we get into the message, let's go to Mark chapter nine, verse one. He said unto them, verily, I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. 
And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only, with himself. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man was risen from the dead. Let's bow for prayer. God, thank you for the opportunity to meet together. Thank you for all these folks who come out on a Sunday evening. I pray, God, that they would not walk out of here disappointed, that you would speak to them in a powerful way, help them to understand whatever things they're going through in their life, help them to understand what you want them to learn at this point, and that we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus took these disciples up on the mountain, he explained to them what was going to happen. He said, you guys are going to see the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to go do. I'm going to show you the kingdom of God. Now, Matthew talks about it, and it appears that, that um, Moses and Elijah were standing beside him there on the mountain. And um, I, I did a... Uh, did a um, kind of look back through the Bible on, on at this moment. It's really fascinating. Do you know that in the Old Testament, there's a moment when Moses entered into eternity, crossed over, right? Remember? Fire came down on the mountain, right? And it burned the top of the mountain. In fact, today, that the top of that mountain is still black. It was burned all the way through the crust. It's called J-Bell, J-Bell, J-A-B-A-L, Al, A-L, Laws, L-A-W-Z. You can Google it. Don't do it now, but later. Uh, J-Bell, Laws. And that's, that is the real Mount Sinai. The Mount Sinai that's down in the Sinai Peninsula is not the Mount Sinai. That is a Roman Catholic NIV version. The, um, that, that real, real Mount Sinai is there in Arabia, according to Galatians. And it is in Saudi Arabia. It's across the Red Sea there on the other side. And that's still blackened up there. That moment when Moses crossed it. Now think about this. If you are in time, go with me for a minute, okay? Just humor me. If you are in time, linear time, human time, and you cross into eternity, what are you going to find in eternity? No time, right? If there's no time that wherever you enter into eternity, anybody that enters into eternity, if you, when you cross over, you're all going to be there at the same time. Does that make sense? So in other words, Moses enters in to eternity, he shows up. A few hundred years later, Elijah goes up the same mountain, and he crosses over, talks to God. Interestingly enough, Matthew 17, the moment happens when Jesus is transfigured. Moses and Elijah are both there. They're all in eternity where there is no time. And they come back into time at different places. Does that make sense? You guys, you have to enjoy science fiction to get this, okay? <laughs> now, seriously, think about this. I've looked through the Bible, and I've found several times where this moment, this moment of transfiguration is painted. That picture is painted from different angles. Ezekiel saw it. Daniel saw it. Daniel said there was one in the middle of the river, one on one side of the river, and one on the other side of the river. That's Moses on one side of the Jordan, Elijah on the other side of the Jordan, and Jesus in the middle. He saw them three talking. And what they were talking about was the kingdom of heaven. They were discussing it. Eternity. They were discussing big topics. What Jesus said he was going to do, he was going to take the disciples up there, and they're, they're, the only thing he was going to do is let them watch him talk to Moses. What, did I kick a water over? And watch him talk to um, Elijah and listen in on the conversation. Peter didn't know what to say. He was stunned. So his plan was, let's build three tabernacles. Wow, this is great. Moses, he completely missed what was going on. Because he had his own agenda. I don't know how many times this has happened in my life where I've had my agenda and I've missed what was amazing. You know, I preached the other night about this, don't miss the miracle. Instead of absorbing the eternity of the moment, absorbing what God was trying to do in that moment, all they could think about was, what are we going to do here? We, ju we just got to build some tabernacles to, re to remember this by. They missed what God was trying to do. Um, J James chapter 1, look what it says.
Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. I, I've heard Christians say, oh God, don't give me patience. Why not? Well, because it accompanies trouble comes with, you're missing the moment. Oh, I'm in a storm, I'm in a terrible storm. Where's Jesus in the storm? Lo, I'm with you always. You're so caught up on the storm that you're missing the moment. You're missing what's going on, what he's trying to show you. He may have brought you to this point where your faith has to be tried and tested, and you're missing the moment because you're caught up in your own agenda. Does that make sense? I've done it. More than once, I'm ashamed to say. I'm not going to criticize Peter, James, and John for this. But I'm going to tell you this. They missed the purpose of the moment. Look at verse 11. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man, watch this, that he must suffer many things and be said at naught. But I say unto you that Elias indeed is come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. And they missed that. The message. The entire time the disciples are thinking, they've got in their heads, we're going to build a kingdom. We're going to build a kingdom. We're going to build a kingdom. Jesus is the king. We're going to take down the Romans. They had it all figured out, and it was all so figured out in their heads that they could not accept any changes. It's almost like um, someone with Asperger's. You know, a person with, I believe it's Asperger's, is the, is the, is the uh, deal where people, they can't take change. They're, they're very organized, very OCD. And uh, or CDO with all the letters in the proper order. And, uh, you know, they're, they're very, very, uh, you know, and if you get them out of balance and you change the scheme, that it just blows their world. Um, these guys, they had it made, they had their minds made up on exactly how God was going to do things and what he was going to do. They were okay with him doing it his way, but they wanted the results that they had planned. Does that make sense? And because of that, they missed everything he was trying to say. I don't know how many times I've been preaching something and I've tried to communicate and people will get up and walk out and totally not get what I was trying to say. Happens to me a lot. It's my fault. I tell my speech class that if, if the people in the, in the seats that are listening to you don't understand what you're saying, it's not their fault, it's your fault. And I, I accept that responsibility, but it is frustrating sometimes when you try your best to explain something and people get a whole, you know why? Because everything you're hearing, you're hearing it through your perspective. How many times have you sat there in the church and thought, he's talking about me. Who told him that? And so you think you miss, you miss the whole message because you think, wow, he's mad at me or he's, he's preaching at me now. And so you totally miss what God's trying to say to you. Because in your mind, this is what's going on. And he's got a message for you. Here he's explaining to the disciples exactly what's going to happen next. He tells them, I'm going to die. And they're like, whatever. I'm hungry. Or whatever, you know, sure, Jesus, whatever. Peter at one point says, no, not so, Lord, that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, you're crazy. You're not, no. And the Lord looked at him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. He had his whole ministry been trying to prepare them. This is how I'm going to do it. This is what's going to happen. And they totally missed it. Can I, can I say to you tonight, if God's talking to you tonight, open your mind and heart. Don't miss it because you've got in your head, this is what he's actually saying. He's really talking about this. Have you, ever, have you ever heard a preacher give an illustration and you sat there and lost the whole point of the illustration because you were trying to figure out who he was talking about? Huh? No, you guys are just staring at me. 
Like, no, we never do that. <laughs> Whatever. The truth is, sometimes you're sitting there and you miss the message. Open your mind and heart when the preacher is preaching because it might be just the thing you need to understand how to get through the next few days, right? Third thing I want you to see. Let's go to chapter, or verse 19. What happened as they come down off the mountain, Jesus has taught the disciples. As he comes to the disciples, he saw, sees a multitude, the other disciples, the scribes are questioning them and so on. And he tries to find out what's going on. And, and verse 17 said, one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he terreth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast them out. They could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. <laughs> and they brought him unto them, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and in the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, his reply, look at this, If thou canst believe, throws it right back at him. He said, If thou canst, if you can do anything. Jesus said, If you can believe. All things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto them, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he rose. Now, I want you to see this missed blessing. It was a, you know, lack of faith. Lack of faith is a problem all the time. The Bible tells us faith is a victory that overcomes the world. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Here's Jesus. He comes upon this scene, and there's a problem. He doesn't see the problem. He looks at them, and he says to them, why didn't you believe me? Can he say that to you? Have you ever, have you ever been in a place in your life where you needed faith and you just didn't have it. A friend of mine was um, posted something online recently and said they were moving to another place, a new ministry, and God was giving them an opportunity, and they were excited about it. And some lady got on and said, well, I wish God would give me some, some good opportunity and blessing. And I'm like, oh. So they replied and, and said, well, you know, I'm sorry you're in this. But yeah, just everything I do just turns to rust. I'm like, Okay, put it all out there for everybody to read. Sorry about that. But that, that's the, the wow, come. You got all these blessings, all these wonderful things happen to you. How come it doesn't happen to me? Well, I'm going to tell you something. God brings you to those places where faith is the only thing that's going to carry you through. And he wonders why there's no faith. He shows you over and over and over again how he blesses you how he fixes a problem in your life and yet you come to another problem and you want to quit on him again and he's like how long do I have to put up with this I've showed you and showed you and showed you has not God showed himself to the world well you didn't show me oh yeah he did remember the story about Jesus Think about Jesus. Do you know every major religion in the world believes that Jesus existed and was a prophet? The Hindus believe he was the son of God. The Muslims believe that he was a great prophet and that he died, was buried, and rose again, and is coming back again. They all believe in him. You know why? Because it's indisputable facts. You read the stories of Jesus, and you'll see that he was here. He was who he said he was. He did what he said he was going to do. I was reading Josephus the other day. It was, it's a history, a Jewish history. And he says, um, he says something like this. And then there was this man named Jesus that came onto the scene. And he claimed he was the son of God. And he undoubtedly was because he did things that no other man could do. I'm mean, just a secular historian that had witnessed Jesus. These stories are, are so common. Oh, my goodness. 
So, well, the Lord, are you, are you really going to resurrect people from the dead? He shows you over and over and over again how he's going to do it. Every spring, when the trees come back to life, every spring, when the, plant, the, the farmers plant their seeds in the field, he shows you how resurrection works. He's programmed it into the very the fabric of our world, right? And stop for a minute. And think about what has he done for you in the past? I want everybody in this room to stop and think of one thing in the past. It doesn't have to be recent. One thing in the past that God did for you that really was a big deal. Stop and think about it for a minute. Take a minute. I want you all to think about it. It shouldn't take you very long. I mean, you don't have to have something really special. Just anything. Anything that was a really big deal. I was riding my bicycle. I was 16 years old, riding my bicycle down County Road uh, 35. I was heading over to a friend's place. It's kind of a gradual slope from County Road 52 down to County Road 50 where my friend lived. I had left the church, the school. And I was riding my bike. I was excited. I was going to spend the evening with my friend. Halfway down the hill, we decided to start doing tricks on the bike. We used to do that a little bit. And I'm not going to describe to you what we did on the bikes because somebody here might try it. But um, anyway, my friend saw me doing something weird and thought I was trying to do a trick on the bike. School bus was coming up this way. And I was having an epileptic seizure while I was riding a bike towards a school bus. My friend later said that the bike went off to the right, went down into the deep ditch, I stayed on top of it. The bike laid down as if somebody had just laid it down. When I woke up, I was back at the church, had no idea what had happened and had no sores, no bruises, nothing. Just God did that. He saved my life. Boy, having a seizure, the bus could have done nothing about it. I could have gone right into the bus, would have died. That's a big deal, right? I mean, I think it's pretty cool. Huh? Maybe your story's something different. How many of you thought of something? Let me see your hands. Thought of something. Anybody want to share it? I'm not going to force you to, but anybody want to share it? Go ahead, Lana. My new car. I just my new car and saved two feet of my life. Because I told you about that. The car passed two cars in front of us. stopped and there was a happened to be a road right there that I could pull off and the whole traffic when I got stopped everyone stopped they saw what happened and that new car that she was driving saved her, her in Tuesday's life what a blessing God God used it yeah for sure God protected him yeah yeah landed not too long ago you were t taken down the country road I hear you I come driving up and landed cars on its on its roof and I'm like oh no Oh, well, it looked like it was on its roof when I saw it. It wasn't on its side. Okay, specifically, you can ask the details. But to me, it was looked pretty bad. The whole thing looked messed up. And uh, Landon and his brother walked away without hardly a scratch, with hardly a scratch. And God's, God's, that's a big deal, isn't it? What else? Anybody else want to share something? Sierra? And probably, you probably wouldn't be here today. Yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah, another accident. Anybody else want to share something? Go ahead, back there. And you've thought about giving them back, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> right. Right.
sure is. And we're so glad to have these two part of our church family. What a blessing. What a miracle, huh? Somebody else. Wow. So rough come right off when you're sleeping. Wow. Talk about a moon roof, huh? Wow, that's pretty that's pretty amazing, isn't it? So now tornadoes fr freak you out probably, right? Lightly, okay. All right. Somebody else? Olivia. Yeah. With your grandma, God spared her. That was a miracle, wasn't it? What God did and the, how she's been able to recover. What a blessing. Somebody else? Yeah. Amen. God just moved you out here, gave you the job right when you needed it. They created a job for you. We, we talked on the phone several times. You were looking for a church. We're glad you found us. We're really glad to have you guys. Really, really are. So, yeah, that's a blessing. Somebody else? So, my point simply is this. God... You look back through your life, every time you come up against a brick wall and it feels like you can't get through it, it feels like there's you know, Red Sea crossing and you can't make it through, what do you do? You look back and think about all the plagues that he delivered you from, all the miracles that he did, right? All the things, and that builds your faith. And Jesus says, you know, I showed you this. You know, what about the five loaves and two fishes? You know, what about... What about this person that got healed? What about that person? And he looks at everyone and says, why don't you guys have enough faith? I mean, I, I'm showing you everything I know to show you. Have you ever felt that way as a parent sometimes when your kids are small? Boy, I don't know how else to tell you this. You know, teachers, when you're, you know, showing them two plus two equals four, and they're like, I don't get it. You know, like, you know two apples, two apples equals four apples. You know, I, no, I don't know how else to do this. <laughs> like, right, Brother Jim? is like, eh, okay. So let's try this from another angle. Two bananas plus two bananas. All right, was that? Um, you know, you, you just, God's like, Jesus is looking there and he's saying, well, Tesla, I don't understand what you don't understand, right? That's what he's saying. I, I, don't, I don't get this. A missed blessing. They could have had a blessing if they had just trusted Christ. I've often thought about them, the children of Israel, when they crossed the Red Sea. How that on the one side they were complaining when the Red Sea opened, the next day they're singing a song. And how wonderful it would have been for them if they'd have been singing on the other side of the Red Sea in the middle of the trouble. And just praising God, saying, God, I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to fix it because you've done it always before. You know, I think part of the reason we struggle with faith is not so much, I mean, maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you wonder if God can really do the things that he says he can do. I mean, this, that was the problem here. This guy says, can you do it? And Jesus says, can you believe? You know, I, I think sometimes um, for me, I feel like, okay, so I don't deserve God to do this for me. Anybody else felt that way? So if I, if I pray, Karen, you know, it's like, Really, you know, maybe he'll do this. I know he can, but does he really want to for me? But that's when you read those Bible verses where David talks about how his, he had 
um, lost his way. I was in a miry pit. And you realize that when I, God reaches us to the uttermost, his plan is, is to rescue us. What did he say about the 90 and 9 in the fold? And he goes out for the one, right? You see, the Lord's compassion and love is for you, for everyone. If you want him, he says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. You say, well, well I've sinned away everything. No, no, no. Somebody's telling you wrong. If you want God, he'll fix the brokenness. Trust him. Say, so, oh, I've prayed before and it, pray again. How many times did he tell the disciples to forgive? 70 times 7, right? Say, so, well, I don't think he'll forgive me this time. Let's see if I can wait a week or two and maybe he'll forget it. And then he'll forgive me. Right? That's what kids do with their parents. Hope, hope and mom and dad will forget if they push off the, the whoop until tomorrow. Maybe they won't remember. And sometimes that works. But God always remembers. In fact, he knew what you were going to do before you did it. He knew how bad you were when he went to the cross. That's why the cross was such a big penalty or such a big cost. The blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross was a huge payment. You realize how expensive that was? Somebody, somebody said recently that they were not, um, they said they thought, they, thought they, they could lose their salvation by doing bad things. And the reply came back in their heart, you're not strong enough. You're not strong enough to take away something God's given you. You, you aren't strong enough. What, what did Paul say in Romans chapter 8? Look, look what it says. Go back there. Romans chapter 8. I love this passage. Keep your finger in Mark 9. I've got one more thing to say to you before we close it. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, I know when I was younger, there was a lot of talk about demon activity, and I've been around some of that stuff, and I know some folks that have, and um, boy, I've heard people talk about being scared of demons and being scared of all that kind of stuff, and I tried to teach my children when, when they were younger that the demons are real, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah, it's, it's real. There's evil out there, but God is greater, and those angels, those fallen angels, they, they can't separate you. Uh, there's these people that come around and they talk about how, how difficult it is if someone is possessed, how difficult it is to for free them. And Jesus is like, come out of them. Devil, you're done. The power of God is so much more. It, it's not an equal struggle between God and Satan. God, God's not playing tug of war with your soul. Huh? Shoot, even Johnny can play a fiddle better than the devil. All right. No? All right. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to Mark chapter 9. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to look here at verse 28. The disciples have come to him. He was coming to the house. His disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast them out? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Again, the NIV in here, um, in the Matthew's gospel, the verse is completely gone. The NIV says, um, this kind won't come out except by prayer. And they leave out fasting. Fasting is required. Okay. Prayer and fasting is what Jesus said. I want to talk about this power of God. In Isaiah 58, the Bible talks about fasting. He said, is this the fast that I have chosen uh, to smite with, with wickedness, with the fist of wickedness? He said, no, he said, the fast that I have chosen is, is to break the chains, to let the captive go free, to deal your bread to the hungry. That's the fast that I've chosen. This, 
prayer and fasting, most of the people that I, that, that I know talk about prayer and fasting, mostly what they're doing is praying and fasting for God to give them money or something. Boy, got a problem, got a deadline, got to meet this deadline. Let's pray and fast that God will do, you know. He said, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. He said, he said, the flowers, the lilies of the field, God clothes them and they're, they're here today and gone tomorrow. He said, will he not clothe you more than that? Well, why, why are you fretting about that? You know, if you get it, find a job and you work at the job, you do what you're supposed to. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's a problem. But um, if you get a job and you work and you get paid and you, you, you're responsible, you do learn how to, how to do all those things, God will bless you. He'll, he'll take care of you. He'll make sure you don't go hungry. And if you run out of money, there's always a homeless shelter. They'll give you supper every night. There's always ways to get money and food. God will take care of you. What are we supposed to fast about? We're fasting about people getting free from the chains of sin. That's what we should fast for. Free from the demonic powers. Free, loosed from the things that are dragging them down. This, <clears throat> this uh, country that we live in is full of addictions of all kinds. Addictions is nothing more than chains. These addictions a lot of times get a hold of children. They get a hold of teenagers, grab a hold of them, and they drag that through their whole life. It's chains. It weighs people down. Christians come to, see, come to church. They sit in their seats. The preacher preaches, and the Christians get up and go out feeling more discouraged than when they came. Why? Because they say, well, I'll never make it. I'll never reach it. I'll never get, break free from the chains. Why don't you try fasting? Why don't you believe God and pray and fast? You know, what, you know what fasting does? Fasting, fasting is not a starvation diet um, that is um, just trying to get God's attention. You know, pitching a fit and we're going we're gonna to have a, a, you know, we're going to starve ourselves so God will look at us and say, oh, you poor thing, you're really hungry, aren't you? Okay, I'll give you what you want because you're hungry. That's how a parent treats a spoiled, rotten brat. And that creates more of a brat. Is God a good parent? He doesn't say, oh, you're pitching a fit. Let me give you whatever you want. He doesn't do that, does he? No, fasting is not, is not so you, you're laying down on the floor, pitching a fit, starving yourself. I'm going to starve myself to death. You don't give me what I want. That's not fasting. Fasting is where you are getting control of your flesh. Um, when I go up to the hospital, I, I go up four, about four days a week, spend a little time up there talking to people. Usually when I go, I go through the hospital and I give out candy bars that some people, some people up there don't know my name. They just know me as the candy man. I, I give out, um, little Snickers bars and, uh, little M&M packs and little Twix bars and stuff like that. Um, and I'll usually, I do that just to try to make them all laugh. I mean, I, I'll come up to, um, a station and there's 10 nurses sitting there and I'll walk down and just throw candies at, just throw candy, just walk by, just throw candy. And they're all screaming and hollering and trying to catch them. And it just, just breaks up the monotony and, uh, um, have a, have a good time doing it. But sometimes they'll be down the hallway and I'll tell them to get ready and I'll wind up and throw it down the hallway. And you hear the yelling in the hall. Everybody knows when I'm there. <laughs> Make so much racket, and uh, they say, the, the directors on like, get get him out of here. So, you know, if they're having a meeting, if I walk up and there's a meeting and everybody's sitting around having a meeting, then then um, I always go on purpose because they got these little. A lot of times they'll have these meetings. Everybody will sit around and then the director will have this those little computer screen. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those. Um, it's on wheels, and then the director will be there, and all you see is his face. So everybody's sitting around taking notes and I'll walk in there and I'll look into the screen and stand in front of them and then throw candy to everybody and then walk out and say, did you want one? And just taunt them, you know, and everybody laughs. It's a lot of fun. Well, the last, the last, uh, about 40 days I come up and some of these nurses, they're like, I'm, I, I can't have chocolate. Said, What's the matter? Wait, wait, I'm, I, I gave up chocolate for Lent. Why'd you do that? Well, I'm trying to get myself under control. I'm trying to get and so what, what they're doing. I don't know if you're familiar with Lent, but a lot of, a lot of churches will, um, encourage for 40 days leading up to Easter. 
As soon as Easter's over, boy, they're taking two and three candy bars. But, but up to Easter, for 40 days leading up to Easter, they do this thing where everybody fasts. Well, they aren't really fasting. They're just, they just pick something in their life. And one, one, one person will tell me, well, I gave up Facebook for Lent. Well, okay, God bless you. Well, I gave up buying stuff on Facebook Marketplace for Lent. Great. You know what I gave up for Lent? I gave up going to Hobby Lobby for Lent. That was what I gave up. You see, I mean, you can pick stuff. <laughs> Wife's back there giving thumbs down. So you can pick stuff. And, you know, it doesn't really hurt you that much. It's like, well, I'm just not going to do that for 40 days. And then I can walk around telling everybody I'm fasting. Well, that's not really fasting. If you say no to chocolate, I mean, come on, really? Fasting is actually taking time to give up something to get your flesh under control. Not just one little thing, but just to get yourself. It's not just giving up one thing. It's giving up all food or every, just drinking water for a period of time. You know, 12 hours, 24 hours, three days, whatever you can do whatever you want to do. And you, 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 you say, I'm, I'm not going to do, I, I remember a, a, a evangelist friend of ours came to town and we were going to feed them. And, and they said, no, we're on a juice diet. We're, we're not doing our family. We're trying to, we have to keep our strength up because we've got to sing and do meetings every night. So we're doing juice and the juice has given us all the nutrients, but we laid off all solid foods for a period of 40 days because we're, we're fasting and trying to, trying to uh, seek God's will in something. Well, I, I suppose that works. Whatever they're doing, they're trying to get their flesh under control. That's the idea of a fast. Because see, the problem with prayer is not that God doesn't hear you. The problem is your sin and iniquity separates you from him. So you got to get that under control. You got to quit the sin business. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. God's not going to give you anything if you've got a double mind. So fasting is getting yourself, your mind, and heart where it ought to be. That makes sense? For what purpose? Oh, I'm going to do this so that God will give me the relationship I need to have. Or so that God will give me the new boat that I want. Or, you see, that's not what fasting is for fasting is to come along and say that this person is possessed of a demon. It's a spiritual problem. I'm going to pray and ask God to remove that demon from that person's life. I'm going to pray and ask God to break those chains, that addiction chain. And then God does because you fasted and you've forsaken your own flesh and you've destroyed your flesh and your fleshly desires. Here's what happens in America. We are so caught up in our flesh we're feeding our flesh and feeding our flesh and feeding our flesh. And our flesh is literally getting fat. I'm not talking about your physical body. I'm talking about our spiritual body. And we aren't breathing spiritually very well. And we're out of shape spiritually. And something comes along and somebody needs our help. Somebody needs to hold us to hold their hand and help deliver them from their spiritual darkness. And we can't do it because we aren't spiritually fit. Fasting fixes that. If you have the answer to someone's brokenness, And you don't do anything about it. The Bible says, if the light that is in thee is darkness, how great is that darkness? If you could help someone, if, the, if you have access to the power of God, that would help someone. And you don't do it. What kind of person are you? Selfish? Nope. Not gonna, yeah, I could help, but I'm not going to. Don't want to. I'm done. You're selfish. I, I want to feed my flesh. I want to do my thing. I want to, nope, that's your problem. It's not my problem. Well, I know you can't fix everybody's problem, but what if it's in the power of your hands to fix it? Huh? What if? And you say, no, I'm not going to do anything. 
I would say that's a missed, that's missed power, missed opportunity, misused power. This is what the children of Israel did wrong. God called the children of Israel out of the Babylonian culture. Abraham was actually Babylonian from Ur of the Chaldees. God separated them out, and he said, I want you guys to be my representatives on the earth. I want you to be my mouthpiece. And Israel got caught up in religion. They got caught up in themselves, in their religion being for them, and their separation being for them. They got so caught up in that that they completely lost their opportunity to minister to the world. And God took it away from them and gave it to the church. Romans chapter 11 Paul tells us, we're doing the, if you do the same thing that Israel does, God will do the same thing to you. If you guys will not um, um, give up your flesh, he said, D -d if, if you won't, God will cut your branches off too. Something to think about, isn't it? Hmm? Missed opportunities. Do you realize what God, do you realize the Holy Spirit of God's inside of you? The power that created the world is in you. And you're just dragging your heels, struggling with your faith and struggling with life. And what? Why? You're missing everything the disciples were missing. And there's so much more. So much more. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I, I pray that you'd use it as only you can. Lord, make a difference in our hearts. Take the message, something, some piece of it, and help the folks that are here. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.